Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Rothwell um, and uh, uh, Eileen Zabarello. Is that how you say your last name? Zabarello? That's close. Okay, very good. And uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Rothwell is a distinguished professor in the Workforce Education and Development Program at the University Park campus here at Penn State. He is also the president of two consulting companies, Rothwell and Associates Incorporated and Rothwell and Associates LLC. He heads up an online master's degree program in OD at Penn State and also teaches and advises PhD students whose degrees emphasize OD. He has authored 158 books on OD and related topics and had 20 years of work experience in the OD field before arriving at Penn State in 1993. His co-hosts are Dr. Eileen and Dr. Sandy. Dr. Zabarello is a senior partner at Rothwell and Associates, and Dr. Williams is a retired associate professor and program coordinator for the Northeastern Illinois University. So please take it away. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Make sure I have this all in the right place. Oops. When technology doesn't work. One more second, let me try that one more time. There we go. And let's see if I got the screen there. Okay, there we go. Everybody sees the PowerPoint. Yes, thumbs up, good. Well, welcome, thank you very much. We're, we've been working on this um, presentation in conjunction with uh, some other projects. So we're really excited to share this with all of you. Um, my name is Lean. Some of you guys know me, Dr. Rothwell and Dr. Williams. They've been introduced. So we're going to go ahead and get right into the meat of things because we have a lot to share and a lot of things to do. Um, we're going to start off with, well, we just did welcome and introductions. And then Dr. Rothwell is going to talk about the purpose of the book. Um, this is based on a book that we've been contracted with Cognella. Cognella is a publishing firm that works mainly with um, academic books and text, um, textbooks. And so this has been part of that, but we've been really operating and building this book from an OD approach. Um, then he's going to also share about why his mission and his vision about simulation is really important. And he's really been driving this quite a bit. And it'll, you'll, it'll be really interesting to hear some of his stories about why he thinks it's important. And he's also going to discuss the ARM action research model and the assessment specific phase, because that's what we're going to be doing the simulation on. For those of you who are not fully completely aware of the action research model, Lewin's action research model, that's okay. Dr. Rothel will walk you through it and we'll just go um, through step by step. And then I'm going to build a sandbox, basically, for all of you that we're going to play in. And that's what we've been talking about in regards to creating these simulations. Um, Dr. Williams will go through kind of a case study, but it's more specific demographic um, information that she's going to um, share and have you guys talk about it. And you're going to be going into small groups. I know everybody's like, yay, small groups. But you guys are going to go into small groups and you're going to get to discuss and talk about that. Um, and then after that, we're going to actually look at the case and what the case is that we're building. And then we're going to do a role play simulation from a couple different ways. Because we weren't sure about the size of the group, we decided not to do a live simulation. And so we are doing the simulation as kind of a fishbowl where you get to observe what was done and what had happened. Um, and then we'll walk you through all that because it's also going to be a small group um, in that sense. So. Um, we are going to move to the next part. This right here, this is something that we we send this because we've been doing this as a pilot test with several different um, student groups. And this is the fourth, this is actually the fifth time we're presenting it. We just had the fourth pilot test last yesterday and last Monday. Um, and we're asking you to look at it because we really want your feedback. We're looking at ways to improve this. Um, you could develop something and, and have one very uh, specific perspective, but our goal is just to really take a look at what we're missing. So we would really appreciate if you have any feedback whatsoever. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Rothwell, who is going to talk about the purpose of the book and simulation. Dr. Rothwell. Okay, so let me just tell you that Historically, um, 
that's where this whole idea came from. Some of you know Dr. Brandel has been working on building a simulation. And I'm taking a slightly different approach, you might say a major different approach to what a simulation is. So the way I define a simulation, although when we think of a simulation, we tend to think of something uh, elegant and expensive, like a uh, fighter pilot simulator, where people who want to fly an F-16 get into it and the simulator costs millions of dollars. And it looks exactly like the cockpit of a real fighter. Uh, we took the low cost option. The idea is that a simulation is nothing more than a case study combined with a role play. And so we've taken the two models, the action research model and the appreciative inquiry model, and turned those into a series of scenes. Each scene represents a step in one of the two models, and we use both models in the process. So the book's title tentatively is using the tabletop role play game as simulation, or another way we could name it is OD in action. Right now we're in the process of pilot testing the book. The book is in draft form, and it's basically meant to be an alternative to a world campus approach of teaching workforce education and development 572 the introduction to OD. Most OD programs globally have an introductory survey course that reviews all the components of organization development and walks through the key theories. But I've been teaching OD now for 30 plus years. And in that time, one of the things that has become clear to me is that students often walk away from an intro OD course where they read about the theory of OD and they hear about the, they hear lectures on video or in live if they're in a classroom, but often they still walk away with the viewpoint that OD is an expert consultant telling people what to do. And that is fundamentally wrong. An OD consultant is a facilitator. And the assumption of OD is that the best expert of the, an organization and is not a Harvard professor coming in with a 200 page vita, but rather the people in that organization. And the problem is they don't agree among themselves on what the problems are, what the priorities are, what the solutions are, what the action plans are, and what the metrics should be by which to measure success. So we wanted to give students hands-on experience. How could we do that in a low-cost way? So the idea is to build OD practice, but through giving them an opportunity to play in an OD sandbox, put them in situations where they have to play at the role of OD consultant and in some cases, OD client. And it's very helpful for an OD student to have a view, not just from the consultant side, but also from the client side. And it provides a rounded 360 degree viewpoint on what OD is all about. So we build on the premise of learning by doing, and we, in the process, help learners reflect on their own unique strengths. They get feedback from the individually, and they get it as the part of the team on which they are part. So our idea is to develop an OD interface where they can practice facilitation skills in a real-world-like context, 
but one that is does not cost a fortune to build, like a game-based uh, video game might cost in terms of time. So we're trying to create a sandbox as a way to give people an opportunity to experience what it's really like to be the consultant or the client. And so step-by-step, step, we go through the action research model, and we don't call our parts of the book uh, chapters, we call them scenes. And each scene is based on a step of the action research or the appreciative inquiry models. So of course, some of you are already familiar with one of Lewin's ways of looking at change, unfreeze, change, refreeze. Here's a, the change process. You see the old status quo. We deal with the resistance to change, the chaos feeling people experience during the change. And then as they go through the refreeze process, there is a new status quo established. Of course, these days, often the uh, symbol of change is a spiral because we have a pre-launch, a launch, but often there is no refreezing process because the change is continuous. And so that's what's new. Now, here's one of the versions of the action research model. There have been more than 100 published in different books and research articles. But some of you may be familiar with this version of the action research model. Entry is written from the standpoint of the consultant. Uh, who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters, but when there's a problem, we go to an OD consultant. Entry is, is associated with marketing. How do we get that call from a client who needs help? The end of the entry phase is a consulting proposal submitted to the client. So we have a scene on that in the, in the book. And then the next scene is startup where the OD consultant and the client negotiate a consulting agreement. Not all consultants are external. And so it's possible that there are internal OD consultants, but still some kind of a informal or formal contract needs to be drawn up. We need to know who is paying for what and who will own the intellectual property if anything is created. We, who knows, we may come up with a fabulous approach to a common business change problem. And if we do that, we need to have clear ownership of it. In startup, we negotiate that and get it in writing. Assessment, we here is where the OD action research model really is different from expert consulting. Remember the key difference between OD and performance consulting is that a performance consultant plays medical doctor. And this is what a many clients expect of a consultant, that they will come in and using their expert knowledge, they will diagnose the problem much like a medical doctor will do, and then prescribe medicine or make recommendations on how to solve the business problem that the organization is facing. But an OD consultant does not do that because an OD consultant is following a different paradigm of the role of the consultant. In OD, we consider ourselves more like psychologists, clinical psychologists. And we assume that the wisdom, the expertise already exists in the company. The company knows, the me members of the company know what their problems are. They know what the priorities ought to be. They know the solutions. They know the action plans. They know the measures of success. 
They just don't agree among themselves. So the challenge is how do we facilitate understanding of the people in the organization? So that's the diagnostic component we're talking about. And that's what this simulation, this scene will focus on this evening. We will not be talking about the dialogic approach. That's a different scene in the same simulation. So this is the third step in the action research model that I just gave you. So water is already under the bridge and students participating in this have already been through an entry scene, a startup scene, and now they're moving to an assessment scene, particularly with a focus on diagnosis. And the goal is how do we involve the client members in data gathering? The whole idea of OD is to gather information about the problems and solutions from the client and then feed it back to the client and get agreement on what are the problems, what are the solutions, and then in subsequent steps, how we plan the actions to implement those change interventions, how to measure results and so forth. So we're, we're facilitating the client coming up with their own assessment methods. And so we may know more about data collection and data analysis than the client does, but we give them that information and help them decide how to go about collecting and analyzing information about their own problems. So with that, uh, so our whole goal is to clarify with the client the purpose of the assessment, get the client involved. They are the ones, in, the client members are the ones in charge. The facilitator, the OD consultant is a facilitator helping them through the process. Our focus is on the process, not on providing expert knowledge on how to solve their problems. Because if we solve their problems for them, they won't accept our solutions. They will resist them. It's got to be their identification of problems, their identification of solutions in order to maintain membership on them. They've got to keep the responsibility for the change process. So we also want to take care to try to identify all of the key stakeholders. And often this is one of the reasons why change processes fail is that the organization's leaders fail to take into account all of the key stakeholders, the people who had some stake in the change process. It's very important to pull them into this assessment process and we believe that a 360 viewpoint is always going to provide more complete information than relying solely on something like management opinion when managers have often not been trained themselves on how to analyze problems and how to distinguish between the symptoms of a problem and the actual root causes. A good example of that, I've been called in many times as a consultant where they asked me to help them deal with a turnover problem. Well, turnover is a symptom. Turnover isn't the root cause. Turnover is caused by something. We can't solve that until we know what are the root causes. You see my point. Managers often confuse the symptoms or the consequences of a problem with the actual root causes. And we have to help guide the process in order to make sure that they get best results. So next slide. So we'll focus now on the uh, background of the case. Thank you, Dr. Rothwell. 
So um, one of the big things that I remember when I was going through the program, one of my favorite classes was, was process consultation. And in process consultation, we created these scenarios and we did and we practiced. We played it around each time where every single person got to play the consultant and we developed our own story. Um, it was also kind of hard to compare from group to group what kind of different ways you would approach a problem. And so this is also one of the things that we think would be very beneficial. If you had a common sandbox and you could implement different scenarios, different stories, whether it's about high turnover, whether it's about a change of leadership, you could implement a lot of these different scenarios that people can experience and try it out. So that's the main goal of this. And right now I'm gonna share with you how we did this. So the first part of it is, um, the students are learning to become OD consultants. So the way we set it up is that they're working for an OD consulting firm. And this is the intro video that they get so that they're kind of situate themselves in that story. Hi, I am Pan Palumbo. This is Chris Palumbo. od for You specializes in organization development consulting. Just to note, it is not the same as management consulting. Our firm strives to help clients discover their own key issues and work to improve their own situations. This attempt to help others help themselves is a noble goal, but client companies do not always immediately understand or embrace it. We both graduated from Penn State University. Chris had a brilliant idea of starting our consulting firm. Chris serves as the president of od for You, and I am the senior managing director. Building on our expertise, our firm covers all phases of the action research model or the appreciative inquiry model. We are also familiar with process consultation techniques and Peter Block's five-phase methods for consulting. We slowly built our firm, growing solid relationships and a good reputation for attentiveness and caring for our clients' needs. Our consulting firm, od for You, works with both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations in a metropolitan region surrounding a large city on the East Coast. We cover all phases of the OD consulting process. Today, od for You obtains most of its clients through referrals from former clients and local lawyers, accountants, and strategists. The firm also receives referrals from the Mid-Atlantic Family Business Council, a group of entrepreneurs and family business owners, of which Chris is an active member. Chris Palumbo has been a speaker at Mid-Atlantic Family Business Council forums. He has presented on various od related topics at the Council's monthly sessions and at the Better Business Bureau. As one of our consultants, you will work in paired teams to collaborate with referred clients as opportunities arise. You have worked with Chris and I on prior projects, and you are now ready to manage client opportunities on your own. Both Chris and I are tied up managing other active client accounts, and the Poppy Candy Company has been assigned to you and your colleague to manage. It seems there has been a major change in management at the Poppy Candy Company due to an unforeseen circumstance, so you will both need to get on the account quickly. We sent you the file containing background information about Poppy Candy Company. Please read it thoroughly. And now, I would like to introduce you to the controller of Poppy Candy Company, Cassia Pinkhouse Bernstein. Hello, it is nice to meet you. Should we schedule a call? So the structure of these videos are intended to really have the students really get involved as if they're the consultants themselves. Um, we've also been able to utilize the characters of Pan and Chris Colombo as a way to deliver and reinforce some key contents. So from scene one to scene two, there's a review of what had happened and what's gonna happen next in the briefing. And during the briefing, again, reinforces what the, um, the step that they're working on. So what is the goal and the purpose of the um, startup? What's the goal and purpose of assessment? So not only do they get it from the instructor, but they also get it during the story itself. Now we're gonna share with you the, um, the client. And so we created a client um, story that's close to being real of what you can actually imagine to be real. Um, it's a small family business that's been around for 100 years. It makes candy. And what's nice about it is we didn't get too detailed on some things because we do want it to be a little dynamic to allow the students to have their own interpretation as to what the characters are and what they're going through. So this is the story and the intro to Poppy Candy. Background and introduction of the case. 
the Poppy Candy Company. In a major American metropolis, there is a for-profit hard sweet manufacturer called Poppy Candy Company. It is a non-branded business-to-business supplier. Poppy Candy mostly sells to other candy companies, who sell the candy under their own brand names. During the manufacturing process, Poppy Candy uses customer packaging and labeling from its various customers. Over the years, Poppy Candy has built up a loyal group of customers and values its strong ties with regular customers and suppliers. Poppy Candy has 150 full-time employees. But during the busiest times between August and October each year, that number rises to nearly 320 employees. To comply with the U.S. Food and Drug and Administration FDA, food safety requirements, the business must continuously concentrate on candy quality. There are approximately 20 office personnel jobs. Over the past three years, Poppy Candy's revenue has increased by 3 to 5 percent. To support manufacturing capacity, the overall business strategy has concentrated on acquiring new clients. So that's the story of Poppy Candy. That's just the foundation of it. And as um, they, we go through these different simulations, the students will take one of two roles. They'll take the role of the consultant, which we want them to rotate so they have the experience of being a consultant, or they take the role of the client. So they might play the role of Ivan Pinkhouse, who's the father, the surviving um, brother. They might play the role of, of um, Cassia. So this is the org chart that we created. And we even created a history with it. So it started in 1928, went down to his son, the two brothers, Gustav and Ivan, they started the company, they each have three kids. So there's all these different dynamics that can happen. And depending on where the instructor wants to focus, gives them a lot of room to explore different ways of exploring these um, situations. And um, so if you look here, and I'll, for the case, and this is where all of you get to really kind of focus and pay, pay attention because you get to participate in some ways. There's Cassia Pinkhouse, who is the daughter of Ivan. Ivan's the one who's alive. Cassia Pinkhouse is the controller. She's in charge of the money. She's finance. Then there's Anton Pinkhouse, which I forgot to put the photo in there. But Anton Pinkhouse is the son of Gustav. His father had passed away. He's in charge of sales. And then there is Magda. She's not really in this scene. But then Zofie is the sister of Anton. And then there's Miguel, who is the shift manager. These are the characters that we're going to explore today, just for today's scene alone. And you'll be able to see a little bit more about it. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Dr. Sandra Williams. She's going to put you through a little bit of a case. This case shows you an example of how you could specify some key points to focus on. And this is going to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion because that's the theme of this conference. Um, Dr. Williams? Yeah, let's stay on this slide for a minute. Sure. Because what we didn't quite make clear to everybody here, and which is made clear in the, in the scenes, the most recent event was the sudden death of this Gustav Pinkhouse in the green there. He's suddenly deceased. He, Gustav, and his brother Ivan ran the firm, the family business, as joint decision makers. So they made the decisions about who should the clients be and what should be manufactured. They both have children, and the children are in the boxes. They're colored by who their father is, right? So Cassia here, she reported to her uncle Gustav. She's the controller. He's in charge of sales. He didn't give her a lot of information to be the controller. He didn't give her revenue numbers. He didn't give her, you know, she doesn't have all the data. You'll hear that from her. And her sister, Lena, is in graphic design and customer service. And then Anton is Gustav's son. And he was like the lead sales guy. He's sales, sales in training, right, from his dad. On the other side, reporting on the operations side to Ivan is Magda, his daughter, and she's in charge of the plant operations. And so there's two shifts. There's a morning shift and an, after, and an evening shift. Miguel Delisi runs the morning shift. Francisco Rodriguez runs the evening afternoon shift. There's a lot of people in this operation. There's 120 full-time staff in the factory. When it's candy making time, you know, the holidays, that bumps up to 200 people. So this is not a small operation. 
but it happens to be run by a lot of family members. And what we're gonna see here now is that the, the fourth generation, that fourth generation line has to figure out now that there's, there's only Ivan at the third generation line, how are they gonna step up? Because how are they gonna run this business? What are they gonna do? They've all got roles now, but what happens when Gustav, who three of them reported to, and 30 office staff is no longer in that position. He's just not there. So that's kind of the background to where we are. Now, if we move up a level, what we're giving you now is a little bit of additional information because we moved into the assessment phase. And in the assessment phase, you know, you can look at this, the situation as it is and think what might be some of the, the pulls and pushes, what might be some of the stresses now, what might be some of the, the conflicts in this situation. But also we looked at outside information, right? We did a little bit of research and we're going to show you that. So the assessment in the early stages looks, this one looked at some outside information about the community in which Poppy Candy operates. And so the community in which Poppy Candy operates is changing. And we're going to show you a video about that it's becoming more diverse in different ways. Its workforce is becoming more diverse in different ways. So people are going to have to communicate differently with its new, newer workforce. So we're gonna show you the video, but we want you to consider, right? Because after the video, we're gonna put you into breakout rooms, thinking about what's now happening. We heard the background, but what's now happening and what should be happening going forward? If you can identify a gap in your small groups, do that between what is happening and what should be happening. Think in your small groups about how should OD consultants determine a, a good way to gather additional data. You're gonna get the external data, but how should we gather internal data? And how should we use the, the client company, the client members to help us gather that data and have them gather the data and direct the gather, the data to be gathered, as well as how can joint work really be accomplished here. So I think now, Lean, we go to the video. Okay. Hello again. I have the results of an external demographic study of the Mid-Atlantic Metropolitan Region that our research team completed. This additional information may be helpful for your work with Poppy Candy. The data reveal an influx of small businesses opening in the region post-pandemic. These businesses are neighborhood shops seeking to serve diverse neighborhoods with strong ethnicities. New business owners are looking for food products to fit their localized customer base, and new community members bring different talent to the workforce. There is a strong Korean community with localized businesses serving some food needs, but there seems to be no supplier of sweets. Business owners tend to stick together and trade among themselves. The Korean community is tight-knit and difficult to break into, but there may be a good business opportunity here. There is also a growing and broad Polish-speaking regional community. These areas are made up of people of varied Eastern European backgrounds with similar food tastes. Food tastes tend toward a combination of sweet slash sour, which includes salty meats, such as ham and cured sausages, and sweeter vegetables, like cabbage, cucumber, or potato salad. From the perspective of a sweet, this community would prefer sweet-slash-salty combinations like sour apple or pink grapefruit tastes. You may ask, how does this additional information apply to poppy candy? Well, poppy candy can easily manufacture candies with a sweet-slash-sour flavor, but it has no current access to Polish-speaking regions. And, the new generation of Pink House family members are not all bilingual, except for Magda, who speaks Spanish. Nor are they accustomed to the nuances of either the Korean or Eastern European business practices. It is unclear what Anton's interests would be in learning to serve these different communities, although their proximity to Poppy Candy's factory would certainly save on Poppy's delivery costs. As a further result of these growing communities, Poppy's workforce is changing in its complexity. Poppy has recently hired several factory workers of Eastern European origin, with a few recommending additional family members and neighbors as new hires. Miguel, Francisco, how are you finding these new employees? 
They seem to be hardworking, with a keen eye for safety and accuracy in measurement. These new hires will need your help with labeling, especially those with English as a second language. It is very likely that our seasonal workers will also speak different languages other than Spanish. So you will have to work much harder to ensure they understand your directions and feedback. While Ivan, over the years, picked up a few Spanish phrases, it is unlikely he will learn to speak Polish. Nevertheless, Poppy Candy's leadership will need to adjust as the neighborhoods around the factory continue to gentrify. We hope this was helpful to you. Remember, as you facilitate the conversation with Poppy Candy, you want to get different perspectives and involve all those who can be impacted, like the line managers Miguel and Francisco. You may even want to talk to the new hires. If there is anything else that Chris and I can do to support you, please let me know. Again, great job. Okay, so before you facilitate anything or break into small groups, we wanted you to actually have a chance to take this survey. Lean? Yes, so again, if you take your phone, um, and it would have to be make sure that it's, your screen is bright, but click on it and it'll pop up on your phone and you should be able to do the assessment. And basically based on what you just heard in this case analysis or in this um, in additional information, Scale if the condition in your mind is a potential opportunity or a threat. And you have the option to do that with all three of those. So please go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna share with you the results as people are completing that so we can see where people are going. Um, so, so it's the new influx of a diverse small business, gentrified neighborhoods, a multilingual workforce and bilingual management. And so look, um, it looks like most people think the influx of diverse small businesses is an opportunity. It slide back down just a little bit. Um, gentrified neighborhoods, still an opportunity. Multilingual workforce is less of an opportunity, but not completely a threat. And then bilingual management um, is actually a little bit higher than multilingual workforce. So this just kind of gives you an, an idea of um, where everybody's at. Now, I know that you're all watching that video and you were really paying attention. So when we go into the small groups, don't worry because we're gonna give you the QR code. So if you wanna watch it again in your groups, you can. Um, it is now uh, 6.35, so we're gonna go, Sandy, how far? We're gonna go 10 minutes, but we have one more slide, which is just sort of how we want you to focus when you're in your small groups. Yeah, hold on, let me take this other one off for a second. There we go. Okay, so you'll be in groups of five or six. You'll be in those groups for 10 minutes. You'll be able to see this slide, I believe. So name somebody who can speak for your group when we debrief. Discuss a little bit about what's happening and what should be ha happening now with this new demographic information. But really think about if you are the consultant now in this assessment phase and you're going to facilitate a group of the, of the client company, those client members, the pink house family members, and maybe somebody who's running the factory, how would you address data gathering with them? How would you do this from a, from a standpoint of diversity, inclusion, and equity? How would you be fair to everyone? How would you include all voices? How would you, what would you decide signifies progress? Of getting agreement from whom and how? This is, this is meant to be more than just getting dad, Ivan, to agree with you because there's more players here, right? And the company is dependent upon more people really being comfortable with change and directing their own change. So with that, we'll break you up into groups. So you're going um, to we have a request for the org chart again, Lean, or can we show the org chart in the small groups? I don't know if technologically we can do that. We can. So um, when you guys get into your small groups, this screen will be up. We'll go back to, and again, this QR code specifically on this screen that you're seeing is the QR code to the video. So if you want to watch the video again, you can. The video is about two minutes. Um, and then uh, once everybody's in, give me about a couple minutes, and then I will scroll back to the org chart. Okay. So Matt, who is our tech support um, and our tech guru, if you can go ahead and send them all to their rooms, that would be fantastic.
Hold on, we have a question. Sure. Are we saying we are using the benefits of gentrification for poppy? Is that what you meant by opportunity? Yes, I believe that's what was meant by opportunity, right? Changing demographics, gentrification at poppy candy, correct. Right. So remember, you're, you're looking at this because the OD for you, which is the consulting firm that you are working for as an OD consultant, had just collected this data. And he shared this with you because you're working with Poppy Candy, and he's sharing this to help you identify what are some opportunities and threats. So this is um, a report specifically for you when you're working with Poppy Candy. So yes. Any other questions before we move into the breakout rooms? And I think we should be going into the breakout rooms already. Now, yeah, Dr. Williams. Well, we had several debrief brief rooms. I, I sat in on one and they were having a, a good time discussing what's going on. And so we wanted to hopefully hear from your spokespersons or anyone can chat in. We need to talk about, you know, what do you think is happening now at the company amongst the client members? So since I want to get this out of the way. Okay, <laughs> okay. Kevin. <laughs> um, so with respect to what is happening, the neighborhood's being gentrified. We just lost uh, Gustav, one of one of the brothers. Ivan is still alive. So so we we wanted to understand what was going on with. We want to talk to the to the children and Ivan and ask them what's the succession look like? Is there a succession plan in place? Are there legal documents in place regarding partnership? Okay, um, so how, how well planned they are. Yes. 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 Okay. Do they do they That's have a plan in place? Do they have a plan in place? And then we talked about uh, you know the various aspects uh, the oper we looked we saw everything as an opportunity group wise in terms of language. Um, from the respect to the Eastern Europeans, we thought you know they could we hire from that community, particularly seasonal. We wanted to ask ask the we're not telling them what to do, obviously, because that's not what we're supposed to do, but ask them, are you hiring people seasonally from, from that group and from the Korean group to, to see if what type of inroads can they make with into an insular community, see if they've already made uh, inroads into the Korean community. Okay. And I don't want to take the thunder from everybody, but I'll give somebody else an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Wendy, how about your group? Oh, Dr. Yoon's going to be our spokesperson. Yeah, okay. we have not been able to go that far. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we, we asked uh, our team members again whether they view uh, the situation as opportunities or threats. And the uh, consensus within our group was we see those as opportunities because those things are something that people uh, can make happen, even if those are threats, we, we can turn those into opportunities. So there was a consensus there. Mm -hmm. um, as for what's happening, uh, we talked about the fact that we need to get buy-in from, I don't know whether that's what, uh, plant manager or shop manager. Wendy, would you talk about it? You, you talked about it. Um, sure. Um, our thought process is that we, needed to work with the community with regard to staffing and we needed to get buy-in from was it the plant manager who spoke who spoke some Spanish and he was dealing with um, having an influx of good workers um, who also spoke languages other than Spanish so there was a communication gap that could be addressed and then um, one thought we also had was we can get buy-in from leadership, but also get buy-in from the community, such as the Economic Development Center, and perhaps some create a positive relationship there so that we can um, mine from the existing pool of candidates that are near the area. And we also talked about uh, the candy survey that was done with the, um, with the two influxes of populations the Polish population and Eastern European, and then the Korean population, and the different type of candies that uh, they brought in. And Dr. Yoon brought up an interesting um, and valid point too with regard to supplier demand and how we could control cost with distribution. Because I think you guys said there was a distribution issue. 
Yeah. And, and one, one more thing is that uh, we need to take the recent uh, death into consideration that yes. it was um, the person was seemingly num almost number one, and uh, there were uh, uh, his uh, uh, children, and we don't know about the dynamics among those children. So uh, in the assessment phase, that would be one of the most critical uh, points to uh, explore. Very good. Yes, the, uh, the dynamics amongst the cousins, right? The children right. of Gustav right. and Ivan, mm -hmm. it would be really important to, to explore. So what should, for anybody, what do you think, how should the OD consultant behave and, and how can they help address these DEI challenges or opportunities? Everybody saw the new, new influx and the gentrification as an opportunity. So how did you see OD as being able to help that? We discussed uh, interviewing uh, within talking to the, the uh, to Gustav or Ivan and the children to ask them, have they uh, found out from doing an interview with the community? Is there, is there uh, from this perspective of selling the candy, is there demand, particularly from the Korean side of the, of the community? Can they, can they use that? Can they get into that market? Or, and we talked about um, also what law, what knowledge base was lost with the death of Gustav? Hmm. Because we we looked at what um, yeah. Ivan, not Ivan, Anton is the lead sales. So we'd really def we definitely want to talk to him to find out what was his relationship with. I don't know if that was his father, but to find out how what inroads he found within the community to see what they could possibly do within the Polish community and within the Korean community, since he was in charge of sales. Yes, great, 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 great way to focus in on that. Anybody else? Any other group? I, I have a question before before we go further. So, who is the sponsor? Hmm. Yeah, well, man. the sponsors. The, we didn't give you that, but it came up in entry and debrief. There was a little bit of a, a mention that both Magda and Cassia, two of the two of the sisters, belong to a con, a community business group called the Mid-Atlantic Family Business Council. And they hear from accountants and they hear from lawyers and they hear from different people. And it was there that they heard from Chris Palumbo. Mm. And so that's how they got introduced to od for You and realized from a couple of his talks that they as a company could use some of this OD help. Right about the same time or soon thereafter, their uncle Gustav passed away. So all of a sudden they needed immediate help. Yeah, well, what's nice about that question though, is that during the startup phase and even during the entry, when they were getting to know what the story was about, that was a big discussions with the students as they're trying to identify who is the sponsor, who is the client. And I think having these kinds of questions and dialoguing with them is an important piece to have so they can start being able to recognize why that's important. So yeah. um, one of the big questions in OD is always, who is the client? So we have to be, who are we trying to help? Good point. Yes. Nope. Oh, still going. Well, Angela, still going. did you have a question? I just had a comment. Um, thinking um, that given that there's a a possibility that there could be some factionalism or some discuss between the size of Jesse the family, Bunch, huh? that the OD consultant has to be very careful to be viewed as a trustworthy and, and neutral participant. So that's a really great segue into the next part. <laughs> Let me, we're going to share with you um, some of this, one of the simulations. So let me go ahead and go to the next part. Um, these are the role plays. So if we were in a class, you had just done this discussion about this additional information and you were discussing it to have a better understanding of what's happening. And then we go into, now we're in the assessment and they're going to start doing role playing. And we're going to share some of that with you. So I'm going to um, kind of set that up. Can I just um, say one thing, Lane? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, when we were working on this seminar, 
we would have liked you all to go into your own rooms, right? Five or six of you and do the role play. Right. Practice OD by going through and being a person and taking a character and being and do the role play. You're either a client member or you're one of the two consultants in every room and everyone would have the chance to do a role play. And that's how we've been piloting this book. Right. But whether it's a class or you're using our book for just, you know, participants in a training program somewhere in OD, you know, the, the whole idea is now people would go in and have a chance to practice OD by being in a role play simulation. Yes. In order to prepare for this seminar, though, because there were going to be so many participants, we advance recorded individuals being in a simulation. Now, it's important to know that these individuals had never role played before. They don't know any more than you guys know right now. The whole point to them was, and the point to you is, their instructions were take a role. We didn't even assign them roles. Take a role, see who you're going to play, play the character. Play the character for 20 minutes or 30 minutes and just work it out. How does it work? How does it feel? How can you facilitate? How can you participate? How can you offer data? How can you explore data? Because we're at the assessment phase, right? So the whole idea is has been we just asked them to, to role play and we recorded it. Now, those, those people aren't actors. What you're going to see next is just people. It's their first role play. So we're showing you how students in a course or people in, a, in an OD seminar might actually role play. And also the other part is that during this assessment phase, it's not just one singular event like we're having right now, this two hour session. This would go on probably continuously and it'll go through the different parts of the assessment phase. So first of it is a, you know meeting with a client and not identifying what are the data points that you're going to collect. And really trying to help facilitate that so that you're not telling them, I want A, B, C, D, E, and F, because that's what's most common, especially those of us who maybe come from management consulting. You tell them, I want you to give me this information and that information. And we've really um, tried to help them. And one of the goals is to have them see when they do that and when they, when they don't. So in this assessment diagnosis, it, the idea is that they're going to collect all this different kind of data but they're just right now in the initial discussion with the client. They just got the contract and they just had that initial discussion. So um, there's two um, OD consultants that are together who are working from OD um, consulting. One of them is brand new, just to give you a background um, about them. She was brand new into our program, into the workforce ed program. So this is actually her first course and she did fabulous. The other one was um, our very own Farhan who played as the supporting role to help and support her in that. The other three, our other four characters were people um, who are part of the client. Um, two of them are students and the other two are um, colleagues of mine that helped and volunteer their time and their acting skills. But one of the things we also did tell all of them, we gave them the baseline story as you kind of see, and we gave them a little bit more information. We didn't want to play nothing but videos, but we gave them a little bit more information about the characters. And then we gave them creative freedom to interpret it as they want. So what you're seeing is a dynamic process between them and what has happened and their interpretations of what's happening. So um, one other thing, yep. we also gave them the opportunity to create avatars for themselves. Yeah. So these are the avatars they created for themselves. Right, so as you can see here, um, and we're gonna show this in a few minutes, but they each have an avatar. We did it the first time without avatars, and um, but this one is with the avatars, so you can see who are there. There's Miguel Delisi, which is in the top left. He's the one who is the sales, uh, not sales, he is the line manager, first shift line manager. Plant manager. And then, plant manager. And then the middle is Anton Pinkhouse. He's the one whose father had passed away and he's in charge of sales. Then you have the OD consultants on each corner um, on the top right and the lower left. Those are the two OD consultants. In the middle is Cassia. So bottom lower is Cassia Pinkhouse. She's the one who brought in OD for you. And then on the right is Zofi and Zofi is a research and development. Now, before they go into this, and that's why we're setting this all up, before they went into the role play, 
there's one other video that we are sharing and we're going to show it to you. Um, and this is not the whole thing, but this is part of it, which gives them, and as we're saying, we use the characters of um, Chris and Pan as a way to reinforce the content and concepts of OD. And he's gonna share this. So I'm gonna share with you the next video that they're watching and then they do the simulation. So this is the video that they see before they start. Let me make sure my audio is on, sharing my sound. Hello again. Congratulations on finalizing the contract with Poppy Candy. That is often the hardest part of consulting. Pan and I are impressed with how you established a good relationship, as well as differentiated yourself from a management consultant. I want to again emphasize that OD consulting is facilitated change. But many clients, as you can see here, expect us, as the consultant, to provide expert advice and immediately recommend solutions. Remember, the client is the best expert on what is happening in their organization. Our job is to help them gain clarity by involving key stakeholders, including the CEO, management, supervisors, line employees, vendors, and even their customers. So now, the real work begins. But before you continue, come with me, and let's do a quick review of Lewin's action research model. If you recall, entry is the first step in Kurt Lewin's action research model. It is associated with marketing. During the entry step, you clarified your role as an OD consultant and gathered information to write a proposal. In the second step, startup, you made the consulting engagement clear. You successfully negotiated all aspects of the consulting relationship, including our consulting rates, how to handle out-of-pocket expenses, payment schedule, consulting work deliverables, and the work schedule. But now you are moving to the next step, assessment, which is sometimes combined with feedback. However, at OD4U, we distinctly separate the assessment step and the feedback step because the activities conducted and the client's participation is different. During the assessment, your goal is to listen to the voices of many stakeholders and facilitate a 360-degree view of Poppy Candy's problems or challenges. Before I brief you on the assessment step, Pen will summarize what we know about the client so far. Hi again. Let's start with what you know. Starting with the history of Poppy Candy. Jeremy Pinkhouse started the company in 1928. His son Liam took over in the 60s. Liam's sons, Gustav and Ivan started working at Poppy when they were kids, and by the late 80s, the brothers ran the company. As you can see in the chart here. The oldest brother, Gustav, is the CEO. Kasia, the middle daughter of Ivan, is in charge of finance. Her sister Lena does all the graphics, and Gustav's oldest son, Anton, is the lead sales representative, and they report it directly to Gustav. On the other side is operations, with Ivan as the COO. His oldest daughter, Magda, is the VP of operations. Zofi, Gustav's youngest daughter, runs the R&D side. They report directly to Ivan. However, the abrupt onset of a fatal illness left Gustav Pinkhaus dead. Ivan Pinkhaus, 62 years old, the last member of the third generation to hold a leadership position, immediately assumed responsibility as president and CEO because of this unfortunate event. Up until this point, Ivan focused on production and operations and served as the Poppy Company COO. He has the skills and knowledge to run and repair all the factory's machinery. But now, Ivan is also responsible for Gustav's prior duties in finance, sales, and marketing. Because Ivan's time and attention are diverted due to his expanded leadership role, the fourth-generation members are now taking on more responsibilities. The fourth generation, which consists of siblings and cousins, are aware that they will soon assume control of the entire Poppy Candy Company. However, it lacks a common strategy and a real business plan. Magda and Kasia, two of Ivan's children, recently joined a Mid-Atlantic Family Business Council because they both want to improve their management and general business expertise. Because Gustav's children were not as closely exposed to the business growing up, they claimed a blended work ethic as their business contribution during a 9-to-5 workday. Interspersed with time for attention to personal matters, 
There has historically been some minor friction between the children of Ivan and the children of Gustav. Now Chris will brief you on the assessment step. So that's the information they get. And there's another briefing, but we're not going to play that because it's kind of long. Um, but it, it kind of sets the tone as to what happens. And it's funny, somebody mentioned earlier, um, I think it was Angela about, or maybe Wendy, about factions that can happen, right? So that's a, that's a possibility. The faction could be in different ways. It could be the, the brother, sister against each other, or it could be, you know, um, by org chart, or it could be by family. So there's a lot of different possibilities based on who and how they're interpreting the characters. So now we're going to share with you that. And this is, this is a little bit long. It's about 10 minutes, just so you know. And here's my request. When you watch this, and um, I want you to think about what you already know about what you've just assessed, what you've heard from just that video was played, how would you handle and what would you do in these situations? And we highlighted some of the key discussions. Again, these are um, students and colleagues, and we didn't give them a script. This is not a script. That was just them speaking and sharing what their interpretation of the story is. And we're focusing right now in terms of the client. And if you were the OD consultant, what would you do differently? Um, after we play this, we're going to try the small group again, just so you each can have a little bit more discussion. Jose is going to help me with that. Um, but let's go ahead and play this video first. I kind of feel like the lines between our family and our business are blurred. And perhaps this is where Zofi specifically is getting confused because she's in the grieving process. You know, we lost our father who was the CEO as long as we've been alive. I mean, both Uncle Ivan and our father Gustav, you know, they've always been in charge. Now, Uncle Ivan, who is now stepping into both the CEO and COO roles. Um, the thing that concerns me is that like, you know, I lead sales and that's kind of what my father was too. So I really learned a lot from him. Um, now with us fourth generation, you know, the children, that's kind of a, a weird thing because we've just been led by two, by two men. And I know that that shouldn't um, really matter, but uh, it's a dynamic. It's a thing that maybe we should keep consider. But mostly my my concern, and um, Cassia, maybe you have something to say about this, is that we have very informal, we, we, have, we have no procedures. We have nothing written down. Everything is very informal because we've all been here our whole lives. And we mm -hmm. treat the business more like a family. And so um, I would think that with this change, we should probably just kind of um, tighten up processes. We still do a lot of things the old way the family way. And although that's very comfortable and we all get along, perhaps this change in leadership, you know, just who's who's in charge and, and I don't want to seem dire or anything, but Uncle Ivan is probably going to be the next to go as well. And when we are going to be the next in charge, us fourth generations, we need to step up into the 21st century. So that's kind of where I'm at is um, we need to update our processes. We need to treat it more like a business. We need to keep the family values, but really refurbish our image. Anton, I, I appreciate your the, the stance that you come from, but I also have to question when you say that you are looking for more progressive uh, appearance to customers, et cetera, but we won't be able to get there if part of your plan in sales is to only wine and dine customers or to focus more on your own sales budget rather than focusing on how to get us to be more of a progressive company. I, I'm concerned that if we continue going down that route without you having any kind of stopgap, that that's going to cost us more in a reputation than it's going to be a benefit for us. Hey, 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 Cassia, look, I'm the sales guy. I'm supposed to wine and dine. The reason we make sales is because of the relationships that I have with the customers that are out, you know, out there. And we have these other new emerging markets out there. We have a couple of new neighborhoods that are of different cultures. I'm trying to figure out the outside, the outside customers. I kind of feel like it's your job to be working more into the internal dynamics. So, I mean, I don't know. If you need me to step up, then that's fine. But maybe actually tell us all what your expectations are. I think that's one of the biggest problems. We have no written um, procedures. We have no written roles. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, Sophie. I'm still not sure what we're doing here um, because 
you know, um, I'm in R and D. Um, am I here because you guys saying we don't have enough supply? Do we need new candies developed? Are we headed in the wrong direction? Uh, so is the consultant to make sure that we do better R and D, or I I don't know what 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 are we doing? Well, um, I didn't think I had any challenges because, you know, um, I know Anton is responsible for the sales, but um, we we developed the product um, and we haven't had any challenges with that product. Um, so I, I I thought we're doing well. So I, I think we work well together. We we had a loss in the family that we're coping with, but um, I guess I, I'm still confused as to why we needed a consultant. Zofie, Zofie, this is your brother, Anton. Um, so, hey, Zofie, you know I love you to death, but this, I feel like you are shaken up by the family change that we lost our father. But this is also a shakeup of our business. We can use this as a threat or an opportunity to our our company and our family, quite frankly, because again, as I mentioned before, the lines are quite blurred. But it's okay to change. We've had this involuntary change in our organization and our family with our father passing away. So just because everything that we've always done for almost a hundred years in our company still works, you know, hey, frankly, I go out, I wine and dine as much as Cassia doesn't like it. So when I go and talk with other customers, they give me ideas of what they would want with our new with new types of candy, you know, our competitors. And they're telling me the things that are successful that they've done. And I just feel like sometimes our our company is always saying no to doing new things because we're good the way that we are. But I believe before we should go down that route, Anton, that we're gonna have to have I, I foresee us having to have more communication instead of less of it because if you're out doing sales and you're logging everything in CRM, it's still going to be incumbent upon you to come back to us and let us know the direction that we need to take. So I, I truly feel that we're going to need you to be a stronger team player um, because we don't have Uncle Gustav to really kind of corral that information and bring it back to us. I think you bring up a good point, Cassia. I think we we have a different dynamic and we need to be thinking about how to communicate and who's supposed to do what. Well, um, Sophie here, I just want to chime in a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still confused and, and I'm getting more, um, Anton, I, I, I agree with you. I think we should have probably had this conversation as a team, uh, rather than with a consultant. I don't know what the consultant is doing here. So, but, um, I don't know if, um, I agree that you're the only one who can step in, um, because I, I'm, I'm ready as well. I've been the call for business. Uh, I understand it inside out and I worked with that as much as you have and you know we've we face the same issue that we've always had in r d things like you know budget constraints uh you know the time it takes to develop um talent has always been an issue um you know managing different stakeholder expectations um and just keeping up with the trends of the candy industry but all those things have been facing us even before you know dear dad passed on so I don't know why we need a new team to come in and talk to us about these things that have been happening. And mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'm I'm also ready to to step up. Um, what we are talking about seems to have to do with the management issues and operation in the organization. You say that we have management problems, but we are management. So what's your problem? I mean, I hate to be kind of rude about it, but you drive me crazy sometimes, <laughs> sister. Uh, Anton, you don't you don't hate to be rude about it. You're made rude. That's that's just how you've always been. So come on, let's let's not lie to ourselves. But I think this is part of our problems. We don't we don't know how to communicate. You you are always on this holier than thou. Oh, it's like I mean, imagine you saying somehow you are the direct inheritor of dad's role without even talking to the rest of us. Like, yeah. what, and you you wonder why I don't come in and talk to you guys, and I go out and drink all the time. Oi, guys, I think that I think we need to just kind of calm down. I appreciate both of you kind of speaking up. I do very so much. I'm very, I'm very calm, by the way, just so you know. I'm very I know, calm. Sophie, you are. You you are a calming presence for us all. Um, however, I do think that this is part of our problem is when we come together, we end up having more sort of feuds than we do ever coming up with ideas and really driving home some of the, the future actions that we need in order to continue the success. Um, which is the reason why we're here. And that's the reason why I call the OD consultants in is to help us put a path together so we can move forward together. So I, I 
will apologize, Sophie. I do know that it's very confusing, but this is part of the reason why I feel like we need somebody else outside the organization to really help us meld together on the inside of the organization. Miguel, Miguel, this is Anton speaking again. So, Miguel, please come on, back me up, man. You are Uncle Ivan's right hand man on the floor. You and I have talked about things that we need to change with um, different products and stuff. I mean, what do you have to say about all this? Come on, be with me here, Miguel. So, you know that um, I'm all for working hard and keeping things moving. Um, personally, uh, conversations like this are, are discouraging and a little scary for me because instead of working, we're here arguing. Um, and I know it sounds like you guys have some family issues. Um, you know, I'm sure it's hard as a family to lose somebody, um, but we have work to do. And so, you know, talking about your relationships and talking about communications and trying to get along with each other is, is fine and dandy, but that's not bringing us any closer uh, to the work that we need to do. So, Anton, I, I agree, um, you know, we definitely need to get to work and that's what we should be doing right now instead of uh, wasting time talking. So I, I'm with you with that part, but, um, you know, I think it's our actions uh, that matter and not just really all this uh, talking that maybe, you know, doesn't go anywhere. Well, this is this is Zofia again. Um, and, and Miguel, I'm not surprised that you're agreeing with Anton because that's that's sort of part of the cause and you guys always take each other's side. So I, I get that. Uh, but the, the problem, the challenge for me is that you guys are always talking down to me. You know, I mean, um, hey, Cassie, I hear what you're saying about needing a calming voice, but that's a bit condescending. Let's just be honest. I'm, without me, there is no company. I'm in charge of R&D. If I, we don't research and develop, there is no company. So I, I just wish that maybe somebody would give me credit for my role in this organization. Yes, you're great, Zofi. You're great. Oh, yeah. Great. Nice. Well played, Anton. Okay. So... I, I think can... it takes all of us. It takes all of us to be a team. Zofi, yes, you're good at what you do. And without you, we wouldn't be able to create new product. Anton, we obviously need somebody to do sales. Miguel, we need somebody to do production. And my part is to make sure that we're financially sound and stable. So it doesn't, just not one person can rise to the occasion and call it a fantastic company. It takes every single one of us to bring it together so that we can continue concept, or continue our success. Okay, so that was um, a recording that was done yesterday morning, actually. Um, and again, it wasn't scripted. They had made up their own characters the way they want. And the dynamic between them was really funny because it actually happened pretty um, um, on its own. And hopefully we'll be able to have enough time to hear from one of the persons who was part of that discussion. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's what we're going to ask you. If you were, and by the way, I did cut that so that you didn't hear the OD consultant's intervention in that. So the question for you guys is, if you were the OD consultant and you're handling that kind of dialogue, how would you handle it? What kind of um, ways would you be able to do, what would you do to manage that discussion and, and so that it's moving forward? So we are going to try one more time a breakout so that you can be in your rooms. And we're requesting that when you do that, that you turn on your camera and turn on your mic, please. And Jose, um, we'll go ahead and put you in breakout rooms. It's going to be a little bit shorter, so it's going to be about five to seven minutes. And Jose is going to put you in the breakout rooms. And this slide will be up also. Just kind of talk about what you heard and how would you handle it as an OD consultant is really the main thing. Okay, so um, you were in the rooms. You had a chance to talk with each other about what you would do. And as I said, this those dialogues that happened was not scripted, it just happened dynamically. And I gotta tell you, when I was watching it, I really thought they were fighting. It kind of made me nervous, but it was kind of fun. It was, it was really amazing that they took on that role so completely. So uh, let's just open it up for dialogue and discussions. What would you do if you're in that room and you were the OD consultant, how would you manage that kind of conflict? Yeah, from our perspective, who, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, from uh, what we discussed is, uh, well, firstly, the OD consultant should uh, act more of like a, a facilitator um, to try to diffuse any more conflict between the two or between the parties. Um, uh, we also thought that it would be a good exercise um, to consider uh, maybe doing some sort of team building exercises, but in order to do that, maybe put them in an environment where, uh, you know, nothing's familiar. Um, as we learned in our, our OD 
um, uh, assignments is uh, you could do some sort of retreat uh, and sort of spend two, three days uh, just sort of really uh, diving in and see what everybody's interests are, um, you know, conflict resolution. Um, but also we thought that um, since this is uh, a very legal matter uh, since there's no policies, procedures, or anything else in place um, that some sort of legal representation should be there to answer any questions. Um, Anton uh, obviously was interested in and in possibly taking over his father's role, uh, as well as, as uh, a few others were wanted to be more engaged in strategy planning and uh, leadership. So uh, we think that some sort of legal representation must be there. So. Um, Sylvie and Yuling, do you guys want to add in, or Fatma? Alice? I suggested Dr. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> there is a book in the OD field called Interpersonal Peacemaking, and it's about applying the concepts of marital counseling to executive okay. conflicts, particularly dyadic and triadic, meaning two executives who can't get along or three executives who can't get along, and how to apply marital counseling therapeutic principles to those conflict situations. So that might be a type of OD intervention here, but you have to be careful. You only want to do what you're getting paid for and that's one of the issues also to consider. Right. And also on top of that, I mean, it, it could easily blend into where you're going into therapy and you want to make sure that that's, you know, what your boundaries are in regards to what kind of coaching or interventions that you're offering or um, offering them. There's a lot of liability that can possibly happen if you start going and crossing that line. So that's really important to be paying attention to that and knowing where those boundaries are. But I want to be cognizant of time because I do have a couple of things we want to share with you too. Um, I know that you all had some more things that you wanted to talk about. And please, once this session is over, we really want to hear from all of you what you thought. Um, we hope we were kind of hoping that we had, I mean, we had some technical uh, technical difficulties. So it kind of took a little bit of the time. So I just want to make sure that we don't miss out on the next part. So let me share my screen one more time. And we're going to share with you. Um, what the OD consultants were doing and how well they did. And as we're doing this, this is what our request is for you. Um, watch it because um, we're going to have you assess, go on that QR code again to make sure you have your phone. And as you watch that clip, it's going to be about one or two minutes. It won't be very long. On your phone, when you watch it, um, go ahead and highlight, and this is on a scale from zero to five, whether or not they demonstrated they included all voices or they um, or they didn't. So zero, they didn't, and five that they did. Does that make sense? So on the next, on the upcoming video, not on what you just saw. Right. So okay. let me share with you. So this QR code. So if everybody could get their phones, take your QR code with you, you're going to click on that and you'll see that there's a series of questions. And um, as a video plays, go ahead and respond based on the OD consultants. And the OD consultants are the top right and lower left, okay? So let's watch them. Oh, and this is what it looks like if it's on your phone. And these are the things, so. Um, well, welcome everybody to our assessment meeting in this phase of our um, consultation process with you. I'm so glad all of you were able to make it. Thank you so much, Anton and Miguel and Katya and Zofi. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jackie, I'm your OD consultant. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Farad, also an OD consultant with the company. I'm gonna help you today. Thanks, Jackie. I, I appreciate your time and coming to help us kind of sort through. This is obviously a very sensitive time for me and my family since at the loss of you know my uncle. So I really appreciate your time coming to help us be able to kind of plan for a future and, to make sure that it's going to be as successful as it has been in the past. And we want to make sure we don't misstep in any way. So I appreciate your time. Yes, we were very sorry to hear about your uncle's passing. This must be a tremendously difficult time for your family as you try and navigate a way forward without one of your guiding lights. 
that is very difficult to hear. Yeah. Um, I hope that we are able to be a support for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So um, in your QR code, go ahead and um, identify where you thought you saw them. It looks like everyone put on at a four. Wow, you guys are really generous. 4.5, 4.0. Oh, okay. All right. So, so it's kind of moving around. So seek mutual acceptance. She didn't really have a chance to do that. Included all voices. She was just doing the introduction. Um, listening to diverse views. So this is kind of the ways, and this is a feedback mechanism that can be used as they're doing the um, the simulation. So it's not just they do the simulation. They, you also now can take this back to the other students and have them observe so they can start identifying specific skills. And that We're would gonna... work for process consultation, too. Yes. Yep. This approach. Yep. OK, very cool. So it looks like the highest was practicing respect for all. She did a great job. Um, Jackie was a little bit nervous. This is her first semester, her first um, class. And she did fantastic for the first time. All right, let's show you the next video. We're going to do a couple of more. We had six, but we're just going to show you two more because we really want to debrief what your thoughts are about how this whole structure looks like. So here's the next one. This is scene two. Um, and I'll, I'll just play it. Thank you. I, uh, Jofi, do, do you see any challenges coming forward, going forward? Um, do you see any changes or challenges for the future? What's your goal or how do you see the company's future? So I feel very confident with the stuff that I do. I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, you know, we have one of the most efficient uh, production areas around. Uh, there's some rumors going out that we're going to have new customers, that you're looking at bringing on new employees. Um, that stuff is all fine and good. Um, but when it actually comes to making it happen, that's where it involves me. And so I'm not seeing any kind of direction. I don't know the, the real value you guys are looking to have. And so I'm very nervous about my role in trying to maintain uh, proper production when you're making a lot of these changes without really, um, you know, having a plan or feeling good about it. So I think that's perfect. That shows how much you care about the company. And uh, definitely that's why we are here. We are OD specialists. Uh, we don't really do anything bottom or top up. So everything we'll do and we'll make decisions together. We'll make sure that everyone has a say into it. So you're on the right page and thank you for sharing your input. What about Anton? You have been there quietly. Um, Sure. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like the lines between our family and our business are blurred. And perhaps this is where Zofi specifically is getting confused because she's in the grieving process. You know, we lost our father who was the CEO as long as we've been alive. So that's another scene. And again, um, we're not going to show them all just because of time. But structurally, the, the, the idea is the people who are doing the simulation um, will have the experience of it. But even the people who are not in the simulation also has a very strong learning opportunity in terms of identifying specific behaviors and specific skills and even what they would do differently if they were in that situation. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and go into um, our debrief so that um, I wanted to share with Dr. Ro have Dr. Rothwell share kind of where he was at and kind of hear from all of you. So Dr. Rothwell, well, I'm going to pass it over to you to go ahead and do our debrief now. Okay, now that you've seen the basic logic of, of each scene where remember the way they're constructed is first there is a very brief case vignette that describes this, this situation. And then there's a series of questions. And then there's a role play opportunity. And then uh, we have an opportunity for the group to do the role play and then debrief about their experience. The instructor facilitator can observe what happened and provide feedback as well as the students doing that. So what did you learn from this whole experience, this whole two-hour event 
about what do you think you learned about OD generally, about the action research model in general, or the assessment steps specifically? What were the key takeaways? Anybody? Um, for me, I actually, it became more clear to me that part of the assessment phase was the data gathering. And so, I mean, again, new to the program, but, you know, read it a couple times, uh, tried to apply it a couple times, but this really drove it home that that was part of the assessment step, the data gathering. <clears throat> okay, good. Anybody else? Hey, I'll jump in. Just wanted to say that um, this is a really great example of sort of the difference between sort of the presenting problems and the root problems um, and how, how tempting it is, right? To like, oh, well, I want to jump in and solve your problem for you, right? <laughs> mm. Yep, and OD people can't do that. The minute you do that, you cross the line into performance consulting. And once you've done it once, they expect you to do that forever and all of your uh, efforts to facilitate go down the toilet. And so, if you do it once and it doesn't work in the company or the organization, they turn around and blame you. Yeah, you get the blame. Get the blame. They don't take responsibility for their own changes. Yeah, Steph's right. Being an OD practitioner isn't for the faint of heart. And you have to be aware that Everybody wants someone else to tell them what to do so that they don't have to accept the responsibility for the possible failure. So what about what you learned from about OD consulting from this presentation? I, I feel like I really like this design. I really like being able to um, see the, just like um, Steph said, I think it was, the difference between um the the con like the consultation what happens at the beginning um but i see this being uh an a tool to perpetuate the inequities in od interventions mm -hmm. and i don't i think that's my concern in presenting this in students is you're not giving them the critical analysis to see this as how it could also how it's not addressing inequities in organizations like I, I I think sometimes people take OD interventions and I for me when I work with other consultants and they're not taking an approach of we already know what's happening or we already know what's not working and we rely on people to make to pr process this versus enforcing something um i i don't i think there are just some interventions um like action research models and i will die on the hill of appreciative inquiry every day where I just, I just don't see us as OD practitioners really criticizing our interventions and how our interventions could be used to perpetuate inequities in these organizations. So that's just my concern on this tool. And especially at the beginning of this, whenever you said in the essence of DEI, you know, you're, you're trying to frame this intervention around DEI, but DEI should be part of every OD intervention especially if we're collecting data. So I'm, I'm processing how this could also be um, another tool out of academia that further perpetuates like the things we're trying to address. Like OD practitioners are in direct con contra or conflict with the challenges we're supposed to be solving with the interventions where we're using it to solve. And I, I don't think there's a critical analysis on our interventions before we put something out like this. So um, I think you make some really interesting points and I would really love to hear what recommendations you would have in order for us to be able to do that. Um, we structured this so that there would be a lot more dynamics in regards to interpretations of different you know, areas of focus, whether they're focusing on 
you know, problems of retention or problems of this. And you're right, DNI should be part of everything um, in the sense of making those kinds of changes. And so um, if you're willing, we would really love to hear more about how to do that, um, particularly in this case. I, and I'm in Pittsburgh, but in our local, like we don't have it. OD is not big in Pittsburgh. It's only big in the corporations, right? But we have a small chapter where we've been working on these things and breaking down like Darcy charts or racy charts, like and understanding how when we're identifying power imbalances, we really don't see the intersections of power imbalances with those tools. Or like appreciative inquiry to me is it, it is something that feels like positivity. Um, what is the word? Uh, it, it's too much positive, false positivity. Um, <laughs> And in the work that I'm doing, I, if people are sad, people are going to be sad. I, I'm not here to make you happy. Um, I'm here to make the, the information and the work accessible so we can all participate in it. Um, and, and so we broke down how uh, OD interventions and the inequities that we're perpetuating as practitioners are happening in that. And I can just... I could share that with you all afterwards, what we worked on, but obviously it's a work in progress because it's not, these conversations aren't happening with practitioners. And well, I, if I can inter, um, intervene really quickly, this is also for us a work in progress. Yeah. One of the reasons why we are sharing this with all of you is because we want to get that kind of feedback. Um, maybe we didn't have that uh, enough of a focus on that. And we're willing to take a look at that. Um, I think the only way that we can actually make those kinds of changes is to invite people's feedback openly. And yeah. so we're we're opening ourselves for some critical review, and we really want you to share that with us. But we're also getting the red flag because time is up. And so, so if you um, could do the if you could do the the feedback uh, form, if you could yeah. fill that out, Amber and everybody, that would help yeah. us a lot, especially if you've got some specifics. Right. Do these things. Pro, you know, pro, progressive. Do these things. Yeah. So we'll share that. Um, we'll share that with the with the team, the workforce, um, um, OD and C team. And so I also know, I want to acknowledge that we didn't pass it back over to them. They we want to say for us, they did a fantastic job with this conference. Where yeah. I mean, it, we've gotten so many people, and we've been getting. I was very very clear as to what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so I would like to pass it back to. Penny and Jose, so you guys can make some closing statements on this. And again, thank you so much for having us be part of this. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, just for closing remarks, uh, thank you for joining us today, all of you. Um, kindly note that we will be sending out a post-conference email with a thank you letter, certificates, and a link to our YouTube channel for viewing the conference presentations later, just in case you missed uh, some sessions. Um, so I suppose we can include your survey in that. Yes. Yep. Please do. Okay. All right. So uh, in addition, uh, we will also have a post survey uh, to support continuous uh, improvement improvement efforts for the conference itself. Um, and uh, we'd also like to recommend that you follow our social media accounts and reach out to us at uh, Penn State ODC Program at gmail.com or of course, you, most of you know who we are, and you can just email us directly. Um, so uh, much appreciated, and enjoy your evening. And thank you very much for uh, an engaging event today. <laughs> thank you, Penny and, the, Penny and the whole team. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. Yeah.